Welcome to Spirit School. I'm your mentor, Danielle Serenk, also known as the Squamish Medium. In this podcast, I share honestly all I have learned about the mediumship and spiritual development journey. My intention is to normalize these conversations, to make way for a more confident, clear, and connected wave of lightworkers, serving the world of spirit with an open and joyful soul. Welcome again to Spirit School. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Spirit School. I have another interview for you today. I am so excited to introduce you to Winter Brook. How are you doing, Winter? I am thrilled to be here. And thank you for everyone taking the time out to take a look at the video. I'll let you know I have a bunch of cats, so you might be used to them during the interview, and I hope that's okay. Of course, if you have any background noise, Winter was just explaining to me she is in her Leo era and she has multiple cats. Can I say how many cats? Six. Six cats. I love it. And she's a Leo rising. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Okay. I love all the cat vibes. So Winter is a psychic and transconfiguration medium, a Reiki master, a spiritualist minister, a teacher, an attorney. And a humanitarian. Is that how you introduce yourself out in the world? If I met you on the street and said, who's Winter? How do you describe yourself? Actually, you hit it spot on. You know, I'm a Gemini, so I'm all over the place. I have a lot of interests. I grew up unaware of spirituality and metaphysical topics. Yeah, I was wide open as a child. I interacted with spirit, shut down, forgot all about it. And then... I grew up and became an attorney. I got involved with Rotary International and I got heavily involved with a program which saves the lives of children who need corrective heart procedures. We used to bring them to Long Island along with other charities. And I had one daughter. I adopted another daughter as a single mom and raised my girls in my hometown where I grew up. Didn't stray too far. Around 2006, 2005, I started having wacky experiences where I was experiencing the emotions of others. I don't know they were thinking. And that's what led me to figure out what was going on. Started at my local library, got some books out, then found out about the spiritualist churches. Found some on Long Island. They seemed to know all about it. Studied with some of them. Then I went to a place called Omega. I don't know if you're familiar with the Omega Institute. New York and California, I think they have locations. Yeah, the primary is Ryan back upstate New York. And I know they do other areas. I know they go down to Santo Domingo or Costa Rica. Okay, yeah. Went up there. Then I found out about Lilydale. And yeah, I just kept studying. I love to study online. I know that's how you teach your uh, students. I think this is fabulous. So I've studied with Mavis Patilla, whom that's where I met you. Yeah. And I'm a strong advocate of continued education and study and unfoldment. So even though I've been doing the work 15 years, I still... You know, I want to go study with people doing it 30 years. Like Mavis, I study with Tony Stockwell a lot. Mm -hmm. Uh, I still sit for development. And then, of course, I share the knowledge and teach. I love it. So, yeah, just to reiterate, like we met through Mavis Patilla's advanced mediumship. I did it two years in a row, 2021 and 2020. So I can't remember which cohort we were in together, but I know that we were together one of those circle developments. We didn't get too much time to engage with one another, but we continued to follow each other on Facebook, which is how come I wanted to have you on today as we move into the physical mediumship questions that I have later on for you. But first, I want to ask a little bit about Lily Dale, because this is something as a medium you hear about a lot. I have not had the privilege of going, but anytime I hear people reference Lily Dale, like I literally get covered in shivers. I know it's a place I have to go. Can you explain to people what Lily Dale is? what the vibe is there, what the intention is there? Absolutely. Lily Dale should be on your one of your top 10 places to go. It is located an hour west of Buffalo, New York. So you can fly into Buffalo and then drive there. 
It is the largest spiritualist community in the U.S. Danielle, I'm not sure. Are you a spiritualist, honey? I'm not, but I have studied under Mavis and Tony, and I've just chosen a life of no religions. <laughs> I talk about the history of mediumship quite a bit, and yeah. Okay, great. So it's a religion, philosophy, and science using mediumship to prove the continuity of life. So what would happen is in the summertime, spiritualists from all over would gather in this location for lectures and talks and things. And it evolved where they were, they purchased the land and they built homes. So now if you want to live in Lollydale, you have to be a spiritualist for this year. And most of the people that own homes are actually mediums. In order to work there, you need to be a registered medium, even if you live there. And then during the summer, between the end of June to Labor Day, pre-COVID, they would have twenty to 30,000 visitors. There's a couple hotels, there's bed and breakfasts. On seven days a week, they have lectures and workshops all day long and then events in the evening. There's a stump, it's a famous stump, readings from the stump, and there's a bunch of benches, and twice a day you can go sit there, there's no charge, and mediums will get up and give messages. They have one or two healing services a day where you can go in and get a fantastic healing. I avail myself of that whenever I'm there. They have a fairy trail. I've taken photographs there and have got fairies and other elementals in the pictures. And they have teachers from all over the world that come in and they vet them. You know, you can't just say, I want to teach there. They will actually vet you and you have to submit documentation to show that you are qualified to teach on the subject you want. So that's also nice. When you enter, there's a gate. And when you go through the gate, it's almost like the energy is palpable. Mm. It's like you're going through, I don't know, like jello or something. It's just... <laughs> and then you're inside. And yeah. Of course, they have a couple of little shops that you can buy things from circles once a week. They have a library. They have a little museum that's really just an oversized room, but they've got original paintings from the Bain sisters, okay. art, mediumship, and the Campbell brothers. So uh, it's just a fabulous place. It's not over exorbitant as far as I think most of the rooms are like $50 or $75 compared to if I want to visit my daughter in Boston. It's like, you know, 300 bucks a night for a holiday in room. It is, yeah. They also have a campground for those who don't have financial means for that. You can bring your camper or tent and I think it's like $15 a night. You should visit it if you have an interest in mediumship. I mean, they don't limit it to the spiritualist topics. They do have talks about a lot of the things, astrology and shamanism, angels, you name it. There's going to be courses on it. I've been teaching there about five or six years now. I'll be teaching twice this year. We're going to talk about that special event. But seriously, guys, if you enjoy the metaphysical, try to and the to Lilydale. Okay, and you don't have to be a registered spiritualist to attend those months that you mentioned. It was June to September, is that right? They've expanded so that you might find the occasional class outside, but the season is the end of June. It'll be June 23rd this year. Okay. And it's generally, the season is open by Tibetan monks who yeah. travel through the U.S. and through Labor Day. Okay. And do you know Dominic Bogue by chance? I do. Okay. He's a good friend of mine. <laughs> He's going to come teach at Spirit School in Squamish in the summer, actually, because I'm tagging it onto his East Coast trip in the summer. So I'm like, he's probably going to Lilydale. <laughs> like, that's why he's going to be out there. So, he does a good. lot in Massachusetts. They love him up there at the Spiritualist Churches. Yeah. Yeah. He's lovely. He's such a kind guy. I mentored under him for like, after my cat died, I was in so much grief and I was just looking for someone to help me like build my confidence again. And he was just such a supportive mentor to me. So he's coming to teach yeah. at Spirit School in the summer too. So I'm really excited. He's a fabulous medium and he's got a very strong following. I know he teaches in Arizona, he does a lot in Massachusetts. He's a super nice guy. Your students are in for a treat. 
Yeah, thank you. I'm really glad. So I was like, are you going to Lilydale? I'm going to try to go for next year. I'm going to drag my kids. No, no they have a children's week. Patricia Bell, she's a wonderful astrologer. She usually heads it up. It's programs designed for the younger so that mom and dad can go and enjoy their own choices of programs. I've been lucky enough to have taught classes during those weeks because I love kids. Yeah. So they'll have programs for the little ones. Okay. I love it. So we'll have links below too, because I know Winter's going to be teaching there, you said, this summer, right? So what weeks are you teaching? Well, they're doing something special. It's not through the Lilydale Assembly, but it's being held at Lilydale. Sue Barnes, who lives in Lilydale and is a certified medium from Arthur Finley, she has put together a symposium, a physical mediumship in Victorian times. She'll have three world-class physical mediums demonstrating and teaching, and that would be Michael Shane, who's famous for his apports, and Gary Mannion, who I've studied with and do study with. His physical phenomena seances are, they blow my mind. And an up-and-coming physical medium, I haven't had the opportunity to see him, hoping to see him that week, Bill Bolt who also does a lot of apports, et cetera. There'll be five tutors, myself, Sue Barnes, Inga Croson, and Karen Richards from Australia, and Julie Andrini. So it's going to be laid out very similar to like the Arthur Finley style uh, classes. We'll all meet together at 9 a.m. for maybe meditation or sitting in the power. Then there'll be two groups. Group A will stay for the main program with one of the top mediums, Group B will go off and have a choice of one to three little programs led by the tutors. I'm going to be teaching trance and also blending with your guides. Other topics that are going to be taught, table tipping, plan chat, automatic writing, automatic drawing, apports, learning how to receive apports from spirit. And if I use any vocabulary you think I should define for you. I was going to ask, I didn't want to interrupt, but if you could describe Apport for the audience, that'd be awesome. Remember, sweetheart, I'm an Irish attorney. We just keep talking. <laughs> I'm, I'm New York, too. So an Apport is something that is materialized by spirit. Now, when Michael Shane does Apports, they actually come out of his mouth. There's video. I've witnessed it twice. There was no physical way for him to have it in his mouth. I've seen him do like over a hundred items. Yeah. All right. The other traditional way that you read about is the apports coming through the ceiling. One yeah. of my sinners in my private group does that. She did it once or twice. So we were all excited for her. Asport is when they dematerialize it. It's like, you know, hey, Scotty, beat me up. They dematerialize it from the seance room and rematerialize it elsewhere, maybe in the room next door. So these topics are going to be covered and it's not going to be lecture based though, it's going to be trying. So we'll have like when I'm teaching trance and transfiguration, which is when spirit changes the features of the medium. Which is mind blowing to me, by the way, which is why I have you on this podcast. I can't wait to get there. But yes, thank you for explaining that. And it can be done a couple of ways. Now, it's different than overshadowing. Overshadowing is when it's being really seen by your third eye. So this happens frequently. Like if you're doing a reading, someone might look at you and see their grandmother because mm -hmm. they happen to have clairvoyance, whether or not they know about it. But most transfiguration is done in the dark with, I like to use red light because it's traditional. And the red light's traditional because back in the day when people started sitting, you know, back around 1850, right after the 1848. Fox sisters. Thank you. You're welcome. I know the history. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> after the resurgence and the birth of modern spiritualism, families would gather and sit in the dining room on a Friday or Saturday night, because let's face it, guys, there was no Netflix. And they would try to receive contact. Or maybe the table would tip, and they would have the fire going in the fireplace. So by the end of the night, you had red light, because it was just the ombers that were mm -hmm. glowing. So that's where the red light comes from. 
Yeah. And the reason you want minimal light is because if there's any type of ectoplasm or energy, it's going to dissipate in the white, bright light for the most part. There are some forms of physical mediumship that can be observed in white light, but usually you have to dim the light yeah, so it can be seen. So I like to work with red light. Now, Gordon Garth Orth, who is in the UK, he's fabulous transfiguration medium. He likes green light. Tony Stockwell, he doesn't really focus on this, but he, you know, he'll play around with it. We're all interested in all aspects of mediumship. He'll like blue light. Mm-hmm. So, I've seen um, him do a transfiguration demonstration with candlelight before, too, when I seen again, him in Vancouver. Again, yeah. Usually the white light dispels the energy. And in the event, the medium is working with ectoplasm you know, spirit in that particular medium, you don't want to have white light or bright light turned on because it can cause the ectoplasm to snap back into the medium in an uncontrolled fashion and cause the medium injury. Mm -hmm. And a lot of phenomena is actually done in a darkened space. And this is one of the reasons that Lilydale does not normally host physical mediumship. The seances are held at Neil Ruzkowski, who's the former president of Lilydale and lives about two miles outside the boundaries. He has his own house and he hosts the physical mediums. And for the symposium, there'll be opportunities for the participants to, if they wish to purchase and see the dark mediumship. So I happened to be in Lilydale last year and Gary was doing one. So I went in the dark seance. Oh, I'm covered in shivers right now. Yeah. If you're listening on the podcast, go check out the YouTube because we're doing this by video. We have photos to show you. She's holding up a photo right now of a sketch. Do you want to describe it? This is my father and everybody can wish him a happy birthday today. It's Valentine's Day. Happy birthday. And at the seance at Neil's in the dark. And we were all holding hands. There was blank computer paper, you know, eight and a half by 11 computer paper on the floor next to a box with crayons or pencils. Spirit absorbed the pigmentation through the box and laid it onto the white paper. The paper was crumpled up. That's why if you can see it, it's wrinkled. And they have names. These are the six names of my dad's children from his first marriage, because at the time he was talking through the spirit guide to me, giving me incredible evidential information that just blew my mind. And then on the bottom, it said, I did it my way, which was his epitaph. This is why I asked him what he wanted on his gravestone. I got the Frank Sinatra song. I did it my way. I keep hearing it. Yeah. Yeah. That's my dad. So after the seance, I had the paper. I had to keep it in the dark. Not all the fine details, like the eyebrows and center, were materialized fully. It continued to materialize over the course of the next 24 hours. Mind-blowing. Just mind-blowing. I think I sent you the picture. I'm not sure. I actually found the picture afterwards when I came home of my dad holding my daughter. That is a match. Okay. Yeah. And we're going to, I'm going to edit this video. So again, if you're listening on the pod, go check out my YouTube and I'm going to link all of winter stuff as well. I'm going to at the end, edit it so that you can have the pictures because there's a few pictures I want to show because I want to talk about your physical mediumship. Thank you so much for describing all this and such powerful experiences. I just think mediumship is like one of the most fascinating things ever. Where I'm located, there is no Lilyvale, there is no Omega, but I did get one table tipping experience once. I didn't know what was happening. I think it was in my third year of development with my mentor. She's like, I think we're ready. And she just puts a table in the middle of the room and we put our hands on it. She's like, sing happy birthday. And we started, which is like the happiest song in the world, right? So we start singing happy birthday and this table starts lifting and she starts saying the alphabet and it spelled out the name Chris. And then it started flying across the room and we're like chasing it. And it went on for about 40 minutes, broad daylight. I had no idea what table tipping was at that time or what physical mediumship was. But when it was done, I was literally brought to my knees. I was so in awe of the presence of spirit, the power of spirit. 
And like, I literally felt like the most blessed human being on the planet at that time. It was still to this day, one of the most profound experiences I have ever had on my mediumship development journey. And I would love one day to try to replicate it. So I'm dying to know from you about like developing physical mediumship. How does it compare? Because I also read somewhere that you call yourself a mental medium. So I wanted to talk about these differentiating titles as well. And then, you know, what it takes to develop physical mediumship. That's wonderful. They'll be doing table tipping and spoon bending too at Lilydale. I was buzzing. We should try to tell them they won't do the dark seances online on the campus. But one of the reasons is insurance. They can't have a group gathered in the dark. Right. But Neil Penn is his private home, so it's done there. Yeah, <laughs> fair enough. And honestly, this is the first time they're having something like this in decades and decades and decades. So it's a rare opportunity. Normally, to see physical mediumship, outside of Neil's, you can go over to England, the Netherlands, Australia, and there's a place in Florida. I might have omitted a few people. But what I'm trying to get across is that any given night on Long Island, there are mental mediumship demonstrations galore. You can tune into these podcasts for readings, and it's always readily available, whether it's by virtual means or on Long Island. There's lots of mediumship opportunities, but not physical mediumship. I found as I was unfolding and learning, because I'm a voracious learner, that most professional mediums didn't even know what physical mediumship was. So I always like to be different. I mean, mm -hmm. winter breath. And that is my given name. My father named me. That my mother's health, of course. I had to find out what was this physical mediumship. And then I also took the Morris Pratt classes coursework, which is the educational arm of the National Spiritualist Association of Churches. So I did their coursework and um, they cover it in detail and explain it. And I was fascinated. Basically, in a nutshell, mental mediumship is spirit relaying a message through the medium to be given to the sitter, vocalized, verbalized. Physical mediumship is mediumship witnessed by the sinner. They can witness it by touch, sight, hearing. That's pretty much it. Feeling, if you don't consider touch. So obviously, if you're sitting in a darkened seance room with no light, actually, though, we've been starting, my spirit team is starting to have me develop new things. Like last night we were sitting. And they turned our lights down after we turned them up. <laughs> turned the lights on. They wanted us in the dark. Even though it's almost pitch black, my sitters can see black figures or orbs in the dark. So you think you're in the dark, but yet you're seeing things in the dark. I've had that before. Okay. But normally, I mean, the cold, the temperature changes in the room, and they become frozen by sitters. I'm in the box. So they're the ones I get it secondhand, with, you know, because I'm aware of what's happening when it's happening, but I can't tell you after we're done. It's flowing right. through me. So we have the cold breezes. We have the children that come around and touch the sitters. They smell scents. The room temperature drops significantly. Last night, my trumpet, which is a long citrical horn, I guess, yeah. it's used to amplify the voice of any spirit speaking. That started to move because I've always, from day one, I said, I can't get my trumpet up. I said that to a male medium and I left it. <laughs> Wasn't used to the New York way of, you know. <laughs> right. Yeah. Anyway, my trumpet's a start and move, though. Let's see what else we do. My biggest thing has been the transfiguration, though. And what will happen is there is an ectoplasmic mist, and the mist fills up. You can't see my face anymore. And then all of a sudden, you will see other faces. It can be very rapid, the faces, or sometimes they'll stay in place. So last night, 
one of our sitters, because I have regular sitters, we're a private group. Physical mediumship is very delicate. Unlike mental mediumship, which you can study for a few years and become very good at message giving, physical mediumship generally takes 10, 15 years of training and sitting and devotion and dedication. And there's still no guarantee that anything's going to happen because for physical mediumship, it's been said that you have to have certain physical qualities about you that spirit uses and mixes to make the ectoplasm or the energy needed to create the phenomena. So you could sit for 15 years every week and nothing will happen. In fact, Stuart Alexander, who is one of the top physical mediums of the century, I think he sat for 10 years with very little result. And then all of a sudden they took off and he became one of the top physical machines of the century. When we do the transfig, the other thing that can happen is the medium's face can look distorted. And that happens a lot with me. And one of the first things that happen, I work with the elementals a lot. They will, I, I sent you a picture, pull my ear out, called elongation, and my ear will grow. And you can see my ear is not a very big ear. Yeah. Where is this one? And apparently it gets really long and then it flaps and waves at you. <laughs> I love that. I just have to say for any skeptics out there, because my audience may not be used to this type of conversation, like we have receipts, like there are pictures, which is how come I had winter on? Because I have never seen receipts like this before. And I'm like, I need to have you on to talk about this. So can we project one of the pictures so that you can describe what's going on guys and just so you know i won the uh, andor in law school which is for ethics and i had a perfect score on the ethics portion of the bar anyway this is something that has recently started happening my middle finger as you can notice is elongated that's the term and next to it is my other finger which is also elongated now, if you look at my index finger, look how short that looks. Yeah, I noticed the hands when I looked at these right, pictures. So here's my left hand. I'm holding up for the YouTubers. You can see that it is, you know, the index finger is roughly just a fingernail short of my middle finger. And yet in the picture, plus how skinny, it looks like just a long stick. So that night, I was just sitting there. And of course, one of the hardest things I had to learn was to go to this. I have to go to these sittings without makeup on. <laughs> I look awful. And they were saying it just looked like there was a spirit hand over mine. Now, that's not the way the picture comes up. It shows the finger elongated. And I just took it, you know, because normally they're elongating the ear and the ear is waving. And then my nose gets smaller and pixie-like. But this started happening mid-December, and I had a class with Tony Stockwell. He paired us off, and the young woman who read me was talking about, I was going to be working. Your skeptical students are going to really jump off the bridge with this. Oh, by the way, I'm probably one of the few mediums you guys will ever meet who is certified sane. Because in order to adapt... I had to take a big test to prove that I was sane and competent to make a good parent. So when I adopted my youngest child, I had to take this 500 question test and be interviewed by a social worker. So I passed with flying colors. Anyway, so this young woman from Tony's class said to me, oh my God, this is really strange. Well, what I'm getting is that you're going to be working with an ET, and you'll know it's them when your finger grows long. I have no idea what they're saying to me. They're saying it's the middle finger that's going to grow long. I burst out laughing. Now, we'd already seen ET's faces transfigure, along with sitters, parents, and then sat for my students once pre-COVID, and two sisters recognized their grandmother's face. So people recognize loved ones, and then we've seen faces that resemble ETs, or what we would imagine they look like. She tells me my middle finger is going to be elongated. 
I burst out laughing. I said, you are not only spot on, sweetheart, but I'm going to post a picture later and show you picture proof of it. Wow. So, it's interesting, you know. Now, whether these ETs are currently living in the ET experience or they're deceased, like deceased loved ones that come through, I don't know. So there's the finger. That's something relatively new. The other pictures I sent to you, my face is gone. Your face. I mean, that's the biggest thing for me. I notice. I'm like, yeah, the fingers I notice, But I mean, I put on Instagram and I'm again, I'm going to have pictures in the show notes if you're sticking around the podcast that you can link on. But if you look at Winter's face, like she is all woman, like she's got bangs and like long red hair and like this gorgeous face. And this picture I'm looking at is clearly a man. Clearly a man. Like, again, I have attended transfig demonstrations before. I've never seen this type of result myself. Obviously, I hang in very different circles. And you, you've probably seen a lot of cool things. To me, this is one of the coolest things I've ever seen in my life. So one of the main questions I got from my membership was like, does it hurt? Like, what does it feel like when this is happening for you? So, oh, one thing I just want to say first in this picture we were using scarves i have since gotten a new chair and we're using zip cords zip ties okay let's explain this too because i also have a question going back a little bit the documentary surviving death right so that's really for a lot of joe public the first time that they had heard about or had seen physical mediumship described. I know that that documentary freaked out a lot of people, a lot of heavy critics, even in the mediumship space who maybe don't understand the history of mediumship and physical mediumship and what it is. Do you think that that documentary did justice to mediumship and physical mediumship? And then can you explain why you need to be tied down in a box, et cetera, as well? No, I, I mean, I wasn't happy with the way they treated, was it Nicole? Okay, yes. Uh, I agree. I just, I also thought that one guy. Phil? You know, he was like, I went to this medium. Oh, yeah. Or he actually was sitting already in a circle for a few years, but he didn't mention that during the documentary. Yeah, he was really annoying. I know a lot of my students ended up having a lot of experiences after that documentary came out with people with code words, kind of like what they'd seen on that documentary. It's like showing up for readings, like, if you don't say this one word... Like, it's not real kind of thing because of how that guy represented himself in the documentary. Yeah, he'd already been sitting. So I thought that wasn't very nice that he didn't mention that. But the code word, here's the problem. I've done code words. I've uttered last minute, the last words of somebody right before they died. But the person just shows up wanting the code word or a song to the exclusion of everything else probably not going to happen because the sitter's energy is also a component of the reading. I think you did a class on this. And that need for that one specific piece of information, it turns out as a fear of lack. That it's not going to come. And that's going to cut off the information stream. It's going to muddy up the thing. So when they want a code word and they tell the medium, chances are it's not going to happen because they want it too much. Number two, the medium then gets freaked out because let's face it, we are all human and we want that code word for them. Because what do we want to do? We want to connect the loved ones in spirit with the loved ones here. We want to, you know, make you feel better. That's, that's why we do what we do. I love law, you know, but I'm doing this because I love this even more. But the code word nonsense is not going to help it to have a good reading for those reasons. Plus, your loved one might bring through 20 pieces of wonderful evidence. And because not the code word got through to the medium, maybe it's not in the medium's frame of reference. The whole reading would be put. So that's really bad. Don't do a code word. It's not proof. What is the proof? The proof is... When you receive the information and you just know in your heart that it had to come from the loved one. The medium's not going to necessarily be perfect, but I haven't come across any profession that they're perfect. Even doctors make mistakes, attorneys make errors, typos, you know, 
So yes. mediumship, I always tell my clients, is not 100% exact science. It's just not going to happen. Because I could be completely right, and the person I'm giving the information to is not thinking of that. They're thinking of, I only want the code word. I only want the code word. And they don't accept it. No, 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 no. Because it's just not registering. And, you know, so that's my take on code words. Don't use them. That's one way to screw up a good reading. <laughs> Thank you. That should be on a cup. So now, as far as using a cabinet, the reason mediums use cabinets is because it contains the energy we're building versus sitting in the open where the energy is just expanding, expanding, expanding. Because sometimes you want to contain the energy so there's this thickening of the energy in front of my face for them to create the masks for the transfiguration. It's merely a tool to contain the energy so the spirit can use it. Okay. And tying down, you need to be zip tied down. Now, I'm just starting with this because transfiguration, you really don't need to be tied down. But my mediumship is in the process of evolving. I don't know in what way, but Gary, uh, who is somebody I train with, Gary Mannion, he made a valid point. That's one of my rescues. I also do this cat rescue. You know, your body can jerk sometimes from the energy. It's going through your central nervous system. So if you have ectoplasm exuded, you don't want your hand to jerk and hit it because that can cause it to switch back into the body. Yeah. And again, when ectoplasm does that, it can cause first, second, or third degree burns. Okay. Just like you're not going to plug electric devices in water, yeah, I've got to follow some safety rules with physical mediumship. Not only that, but depending on the physical mediumship, some of them are very sensitive. Well, first of all, when you go to a seance like this, you're going to take the wand to make sure you don't have any metal on you. Like, I would not be allowed to wear my jewelry. Yeah. So if you can't get your wedding ring off, don't pay for a dark seance. They don't want you coming in with rings. Why? Because what if the ring materializes on the floor? Somebody's going to think it's from spirit when you actually just got it off your hand. So there's that reason. Number two, some mediums are more sensitive and the metal can interfere with the energy. Now, Gary's coming to my office on Long Island after Lilydale. And I was concerned because I have metal pipes in my office. It's an old building. But he said, no, I outgrew that. I can work in a room with a computer and metal. Yeah. Now, with Gary, he's also been developing so that when he is exuding ectoplasm, he can turn on a small blue light or red light, which enables you to sleep a lot better. Okay. But... I hear that Michael Shane doesn't let you have your eyeglasses on. I don't know. My sitter sits with him and she says, yeah, and I, luckily I've been always sitting up front. You've cat. <laughs> I've a foster fail, right? I have four cats. I was very happy. Um, <laughs> what I like to do, I like to volunteer. So yes. we were volunteering, taking little fosters, baby kids, and, you know, loving them so they could go to forever homes. This one rescue that I'm now working with. And if anybody's interested, you like mental mediumship, the messages. I'm working with Rachel Cope. I don't know if you know Rachel from the UK. I will introduce you. We're donating all of our time. So all the money goes to a rescue near me that rescues cats and kittens. And they're kind to humans because I find a lot of the rescues are not. But these, if somebody's dying from cancer... They'll help them rehome their pet, so the pets mm. have to be euthanized. Right, a lot of rescues do that. At least in my area, I don't know what domestic the country's like. So I like them a lot because they're sympathetic to humans and kind. And we had these two. And do you do animal communication? I want to. My dad does. Of all people, I have a really great friend who's an amazing animal communicator and mentor. So I have wanted to do. I just. I've only had one cat and then I just got my first dog. Oh. So, yeah. So I love trying to communicate with my dog. The dog trainers actually do telepathic communication. They're like, once you can send commands with your mind, you know, you're like all connected. So it's 
definitely something that is widely accepted where I live in Squamish. Awesome. Here's a problem when you do animal communication. So I have this little gray kitten and she was found on the side of a busy road. So they couldn't leave her there, but she was certainly taken away from the mother too soon. But the mother was nowhere to be found. Busy road. Got to rescue the kitten. Wow. She's super skittish. Right. She was hitting my couch for almost three weeks before she got comfortable with me. So finally, she's starting to get comfortable. And I was only supposed to be a foster. She looks at me and she just links in and she's like, am I here? Do I stay here? Can I stay? I don't want to go anywhere else. But <laughs> if that's what cat, I'm like, okay, he can stay. <laughs> Not just a humanitarian, you're a catetarian now. <laughs> oh my God, so that went to number five. And then because she was matched up with another calf, he's making all the noise in the background and got himself stuck. That's, <laughs> it's all good. This is a grassroots podcast here. We are all good here. Okay, good, because I'm known for this. Classes with Tony, my uh, red mane coon will hang over. Yeah. And look upside down at the class. He loves to listen to Tony Stockwell. I love it. Tony can't see it because, you know, yeah. You must, but the rest of the class starts laughing. And Tony's like, why is it moving <laughs> at me? And the pictures, because I have my membership on my close friends list on Instagram. And I was like, what would you ask Winter if she was in front of you? And I mean, I have never had so much engagement on something where people were so into this. Now, we did answer a few of them just by our conversation, which I always love. But can you just say, like, does it hurt at all or discomfort at all? That came up a couple of times. Yeah, but you get over it. So, for example, when they started working with the ear, before they elongated it, I felt the pulling on the ear. I didn't know what I thought they were going to make ectoplasm because, you know, ectoplasm can ooze out of any orifices. Right. I said, spirit, I will kill you if you make me lose ectoplasm like Marjorie the medium up in Boston, Harry Houdini's nemesis, Marjorie Cronin. She used to come out of her private part. I said, oh, even them didn't want that spirit. So anyway, when they were pulling my ear, I didn't know what was going on. But eventually it, we were getting pictures of it being elongated. That's how I got my doctor at the time. I was explaining to him what I did, and he thought I was nuts. <laughs> so I showed him a photograph. I said, now tell me how I wiggled my ear so it became this way. <laughs> he says, you can't. So, see, it's real. Yeah. So, yes. And then, of course, if you're a sitter in a seance, you may feel tugging on your solar plexus, or you might feel some nausea. All you need to do is just kind of put your hands here. If you can tolerate it, then allow it because spirit is using your energy to assist in the evening. Because it's not just the medium. Spirit needs the energy from sinners. They return your energy and it's all wonderfully upgraded. I've had like the coffee, they're building a voice box, which is a whole area where you talk about direct voice, independent direct voice. So I do feel some things here. As a sitter, I get a lot of discomfort from where I had surgery when I've been sitting like when it, with Gary. Okay. So that was interesting. I mean, we're moms, so our threshold for pain is definitely a lot higher than some out there. But like one to 10, how would you say discomfort? Two. Well, that's what one of the mediums over there in England was, yeah, you could about how much pain he experiences as a physical medium. And I'm like, yeah, almost as much as giving birth, huh? Yeah. Well, I've seen those TikTok um, videos where they have this machine so men can experience menstrual cramps, like on like a two out of 10, and they're like healing over. So I think that women do have a higher threshold pain. But I grew up watching Most Haunted, like when I was in high school, and Derek Akora was on there, and he always looked like he was like in so much pain, which how come I never thought mediumship was accessible to me? So I was like, yeah, nothing like that ever works for me. So that's good to know. Well, you know, again, it doesn't, but I don't even know when they're pulling my ear out or do the elongation. I have no awareness of it in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I think it's like Gary said in the beginning, he couldn't have mental in the room. Now we can. Right. Okay. That's good to know. I will say I did sit for trance once, like over the course of a few weeks with like my first mentor and it took 
a while for me to get into a surrendered state to be able to experience anything. And the only thing I was able to experience was almost like a pulling on the top of my head. And it felt like it was like pulling me over. Like I was even like leaning over and it was like a bit of a burning sensation, but it was like a pulling on the crown. And then my hands went really hot and I knew just kind of in a knowing I needed to heal someone. But I was also six months pregnant at the time. So I kind of talk myself out of it. I was like, what is happening? I literally felt like maybe my soul was leaving, maybe another was coming in, but it was like this pulling and this tugging. And Tony, I studied under Tony, he wouldn't know who I am or anything, but quite a few years ago, and he did always say, you could sit for trance with me, which I'm interested in. It's just I have little young babies right now, and it's really hard to throw down enough. So here's the thing. Trance is used to go into an altered state that they use for physical mediumship. The trance is not physical mediumship. Okay. Trance only benefits you. Okay. And yes, what you described was probably your crown chakra opening because that's how it happens with the trance. You know, the, the energy, you'll see the beams of light coming in. Okay. Right? The spirits when they influence you. But they're actually not coming into your body. They're just meshing with your energy field. But trance is not the same as physical mediumship. And trance is good for everybody because trance will strengthen your connection to the spirits and actually get better evidence for your mental mediumship. Okay. So when I do looking at you, sweetheart, you would be a phenomenal trance speaking medium. Thank you. You know, if you wanted to go into physical, that's something else. But yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Mavis said something really similar to me. I still, I don't know what to say. I'm still stepping into the fullness of my mediumship. I got really into teaching. I love teaching just like you do. I love helping other people try to discover this within themselves. And yeah, the teaching has always taken so much priority, but I want to get back into more sitting and trance has always been in my peripheral. So yes, thank you for saying that to me. <laughs> we'll get there. We'll get there. Maybe Riverdale, August. Yeah, I will try for next year. This year is a bit tricky because I have my retreat in April. I'm hosting my first retreat. And then I have Dominic coming out too in the summer. So my husband, I know everyone's going to have to listen to this, but like my husband is not a believer of mediumship. So it's been an interesting marriage in the point where I'm like, where are you going? I'm like, well, I want to go to a retreat with Tony Stockwell to do what? And so sometimes it could be a little bit harder to get away with the kids being so young, but I will push the limits to try to make it to Lilydale for sure. Well, you know, I'm teaching the 17th and 18th of August. So see if that coincides with teen week. For the kids. Okay. Well, yeah. Well, and that's the week before my birthday. So that gives me a little bit more of an edge. The last year on my birthday, I went to Malibu by myself. So we'll see how this goes. But thank you. Okay. Let's just do one more. This is a good one because if you teach beginner mediumship classes, I'm sure that this is going to be one of the first questions anyone ever asks you as well. Have you ever experienced a negative energy or something negative? Only from other humans. That's my answer, Winter. That is always my answer. I'm like, I am scared of person with hate in their heart than anything spiritual. Yeah, no, I'm not scared of them, but I have experience. It would frighten me to have my daughter walking down the street with a crazy, drugged up person and a gun, right? But I mean, I've gone and done house clearings. I usually do that. I try to teach people how to do it themselves, but sometimes the spirits are influencing the children and they're having nightmares. So that's when I'll go in when they need help that way. I'm never afraid of it. And I want to tell your students, we're all spirit. Okay. We are spirit incarnate having a physical experience. Then there are spirits discarnate that are just existing as spirits. They are energy. We're energy. We're vibrating slower than them right now in order to be encased in physical form and have life on earth. They are not more than us. And you have it within you to just say no. So if you feel something that is uncomfortable, do not be afraid of it. Just stop, breathe. Remember, it is only energy. I am energy. My friends, as I rebuke you, I prohibit you not in my space. And then that's it. If you believe what you're saying, 
you set that attention, so it shall be. And you have the greatest power of all. You're a mom. So I used to teach people that were nervous with spirit and energy. I'm like, what would you do if you had to protect your kids? And all of a sudden they get, you know, the mom drive comes in. I said, step into your own power. Yes. Yes. Covered in shivers winter. That is a solid advice. So, I mean, we're going to have to have you back. We're going to have to have you back on the podcast because I want to ask you a gazillion more questions. I should have reserved three hours for this interview, but I do things. I have to try to fit as much as possible into school hours. <laughs> so, I am just sharing so the other I read to general mom of Joe, remember? So I get it. It's hard. I it is. Five in the morning to do automatic writing when my little one was still asleep. It's yeah. easy, but they get a little bit more self-sufficient. But enjoy this time you have with them. Yeah. Your father, whose birthday is today. Happy birthday, Valentine. He used to say to me all the time, enjoy them while you're young. You know, you know, time passes like no tomorrow. And here I am. My baby turned 21 this week. And my big one is 28 and she's a doctor. Yeah. They're all grown up. Yeah. yeah. Week I adopted her, and the week before that I gave birth. So I don't know what happened to her. By too fast, I know. Oh, well, and I'm ex- yeah, I will, and I'm really excited too because you said you would come into the Spirit School Collective and teach a class, which I'm really excited about. So we'll have to organize that for March or April or whenever you're available. But Winter, it's been a joy to get to know you better through this interview, and I know that we'll stay in touch and we'll see you in the collective, and we will absolutely have you back on the podcast, maybe after Lilydale figure out all the stories that happened for you. Maybe we'll have you back to tell some of the stories of what happened this year. Awesome. Thank you so much, sweetheart. And thank you everyone for listening and stopping by. God bless you. Did you know that Spirit School is not just a podcast? It's an actual school. If you go to myspiritschool.com, you can invest in self-study courses, live programs, and of course, the Spirit School Collective, my baby, my monthly membership community. All Spirit School offerings are intended to get you feeling clear, confident, and connected to your spiritual path, your development journey, and of course, connected to other spiritual curious souls who are having similar experiences to you. I hope to see you in Spirit School.